Hey folks, it's Maxi here and welcome to another TW 2020 video. You join us today for our first show after our latest AW pay-per-view, which was of course Full Gear. And we'll be going for a pay-per-view at the last week of December, so a six-week build. So that'll be three episodes on YouTube, of course three times two. Two episodes of Dynamite per video on YouTube, so hopefully a good build. And the event we're going to have is going to be called AEW End of the Line. Because obviously the end of the year was my thinking with that. Now it's been a wee while since I've booked full gear. But the good thing is when you don't... When you book how I book, which can be kind of bulky at times. So I can like leave a lot back dated. But the breaks in between allows us to obviously watch wrestling and learn a lot about the, the characters. And in that time I've watched a lot of um, obviously Dynamite. And a lot of being the elite, so I have a lot more of an idea on certain characters. So you may see people who were getting jobbed out before kind of getting a bit more of a push because we know what they're all about. So hopefully that translates well. So we'll jump into the show as always. If you want to get social, you know what to do. If you want to buy the game, link in the description below. Also to the forums, to the subreddit, to twdb.com, everything you need. Is down there. So without further ado, let's crack on with week one of our double booking of AEW Wednesday Night Dynamite. So quite a stacked show today, 16 segments, two pre-show matches as well from Glens Falls, New York, where 9,235 fans are in attendance. I started off with a decent pre-show match that saw Private Party defeat the Dark Order in 8.39 when Isaiah Cassidy defeated Stu Grayson. Eva Luna was the weak link here, a 62. Honestly, just keeping Private Party with a good bit of momentum, a very, very exciting tag team. And the Dark Order, obviously, not quite up there with in terms of the leader, Brody Lee, and of course the other member, Darby Allen. And we all know that John Silver and Alex Reynolds are portraying, quite frankly, chopper roles. And next up, we had a tag team match in our women's division and that was a pre-show bout that had decent reaction from the crowd but subpar wrestling is the team of the AW Women's Champion Nikki Storm and Diona Peruzzo defeated Awesome Kong and B Priestley in 728 when Nikki pinned B with the perfect storm. Nikki carries the match, the fans still are not vocal on Peruzzo and Priestley and didn't help that B was off her game as was Awesome Kong but we'll work with them and will hopefully get the successful attributes and the particular character, uh, characteristics that they need to ensure that's not. Although, I'd be quite intrigued to see if I can get someone over, despite that note. But that's your pre-show action. Main card time. So we start the show with Cody and MGF trading words. Now if you watched our last video, you'd know that Cody has one and only opportunity for the AW World title. And it was MGF that screwed him there. And that gave a 94 weighted promo. So what we what I'm looking for here is basically MGF saying I've been winning constantly and I don't get any title opportunities. But oh look, Cody's in a place of power. He gets the opportunity. Shock horror. Not on my watch, she says. So what we've decided to do is tonight's main event we'll see Cody take on MGF. If MGF can beat Cody, then Cody will grant MGF a match at end of the line against John Moxley for the AEW World Championship. So a very solid 94 promo. Opening contest was a decent matchup that saw the team of Brian Cage and Jacob Fatu, the Titans, defeat the natural nightmares of Dustin Rhodes and QT Marshall in 837 when Brian Cage pinned QT Marshall with machine termination. 61, Cage was off his game. Simple matchup making the Titans continue to look dominant. Next up, an argument between Cody and Brandy Rhodes. Brandy's obviously a bit frustrated with Cody, although what I'm really doing here is just kind of splitting them up. Obviously, Brandy the force is Cody in this, and she's went away with Frankie Kazarian because Frankie didn't have a relationship with Tracy Brooks. So obviously, we're splitting the married couple to go with what's happened in game. So that was a sixty-seven. Next up we had a good matchup that saw the Dark Orders Brody Lee and Darby Allen defeat the best friends, Chuck Taylor and Trent Beretta in 9.55 when Darby Allen pinned Chuck Taylor with a coffin drop. 
a 70 matchup, so very good there. And you can see that Darby Allen and Brody Lee just in a different class in terms of in ring performance. After this, we basically see the team of Brody Lee alongside Stu Grayson and Eva Luno decide to break, uh, beat down Orange Cassidy, who was ringside. So, the Dark Order making up for a loss on the pre show, the Freedom beating up Orange Cassidy, and that got us a 54 rating there. We then had a matchup that was extremely short and very poor, as Chris Jericho defeated Michael Nakazawa in 448 with the code breaker. Nakazawa was off his game, Jericho just for 57. The worrying thing is, despite obviously Jericho being absolutely outstanding IRL at the moment, he's. Um, Stats obviously when he has to decline do not quite fit with AEW's product, so yeah, in the ring, not very good. But a good one for Y2J. I don't know why Jericho's not got a picture, I'll need to fix that when we came out with this. We then had a piece of promo after it, and it was Chris Jericho alongside Sammy Guevara, Santana and Ortiz, Jake Hager, and Cash Wheeler. And it's just Jericho saying the inner circle is back, united as one, not going anywhere. Jericho just needs a few weeks away, but the inner circle still remains strong. We had a hype package for the Butcher, the Blade and the Bunny, that was a 25. Keeping the Bunny with them because she's very over in this. And the Butcher and the Blade are the biggest case of two guys I thought were complete jobbers, despite knowing who Pepper Parks was. And their presentation in AEW the last couple of weeks at recording, so basically over the summer has been nothing but short of spectacular. The Butcher went for somebody went, who's this old guy, to like, oh my god, he'd absolutely destroy you, he'd kill you, basically. So, big props to them making the Butcher look an absolute million bucks. So, there we get a wee push going forward. And they were in action against Joe Janela and Sonny Kiss. And it was about to have, not a lot of heat, but in terrible wrestling. But the Butcher and the Blade defeat Sonny Kiss and Janela with the Butcher pin Kiss in 6.58. And this kind of matchup. There's a big difference in uh, pop between Joey Janela and Sonic Kiss. That's why they mesh well together. So hopefully Sonic Kiss can elevate, not just stats-wise, but also in terms of popularity. Being with Joey Janela, and it gives a good win for the Butcher and the Blade. Next up, we had a good matchup. that saw Lance Archer defeat Alex Shelley in 10:28 with a blackout. Lance Archer made his fifth defense of the AEW TNT Championship. So good to see they've got great chemistry. Wasn't aware of that, so that's always a plus to see. A 69 though, and another defence for the dominant champion going forward. However, Lance Archer decides to beat him up post-match, how we have a saviour to save the day, a potential future opponent for Lance Archer, as the debuting Claudio Castagnoli makes the save, cleans house, sends Archer to the back, Saving Alex Shelley. So a 59 for the segment. Castagnoli debuted his legitimate athlete gimmick, which was a great rating. The performance of Archer was good. Jake Roberts helped Archer and Castagnoli benefited from a groundswell of public support. The gimmick change uh, can be penalised for comedy stuff, for, uh, but although it can be a very marketable gimmick and will sell a lot more merchandise than usual. So just to add as well, this rating is likely to rise over time as the fans get used to the new gimmick. It's worth noting that our product means that gimmicks are not required, although they do have an effect if used. Buzzing to get cloudy on. Kenny Omega cuts a promo on Hangman Page. This promo is 1-1, as we know, Kenny winning the cage match. And it's Kenny saying it's 1v1, End of the line is the next pay per view. Let's make this the end of the line pay per view. Uh, end of the line of the feud. Winner moves on. Loser sulks. What do you say, Hangman? Do you want to go one more time? So that was a 79 from Kenny's promo. We then had some tag team action, and it was about to have great wrestling and good heat. As with the Young Bucks defeat Angelico and Jack Evans, Hybrid 2, in 1411. When Matt Jackson pinned on Helico, 81. Both teams are really, really good together. Obviously, the, the Bucks got a lot of boosts in this as a kill in the business mod. And Helico was a weak link. But I know these two teams are going to put a spectacular match on. 
and just to give us a really good co-main event. We then have John Moxley coming down to the ring to do a colour commentary, which was a 71, as he prepares to see who will win out of Cody and MGF. And the main event itself was only a 66, so we are taking probably a popularity hit, more so in the term of um, continuing storylines, but that's cool. There's a bit more realism with that, the fact is we're not just going to be aiming to go pop, pop, pop gains all the time. We are going to try and get storylines over. And it was about they had fantastic heat and good wrestling. MGF defeats Cody to become the number one contender in 2149 with a swan top bomb after Cody was turned on by Brandy Rhodes. That Jezebel screams JR, the 66. Both guys with decent performances and 16 segments. She is now a heel. And we end the show with Moxley and MGF getting in each other's faces to a 74. Oh, well, that's quite interesting. So I must have changed the the way the show's rated to being based on our best match and, well, it would have been the main event. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it is based on the best couple of matches, but I think that match must have saved us there. I'll actually double check that. But, no pop losses, a 78, and increases our popularity in 30 regions, so... I'm fairly happy with that because we don't, we, as I say, we were focusing primarily on straight off the bat storyline, storyline, storyline. Um, probably not using the actual storyline feature in the game, but just getting stuff over and sawing a cab prepared for end of the line. I'm not going to lie, that's a nice wee person that could pop up and have some good matches in AEW. Uh, just a wee quick look then. Matt Jackson says Brandy is poor psychology. I mean, be saying that brandy, but okay. I prefer position in the company. 2.70 was the television rating on Dynamite. And last but not least, before we jump into the second episode, AW Dark witnessed Wardlow defeating Austin Gunn, Andy Hartwell defeating Shanna, Cash Wheeler defeating Brandon Cutler, Chris Statlander versus Killer Kelly, and a win in the main event for Luchasaurus, as they try and write some people off television. The deal for AW Dark is due to end soon um, and we will just be featuring more people on the pre-show uh, 11 days, everything is going to end, so I think we get one more episode of Dark um, and that'll be fine that's cool as you can see there we'll just have a real look there, so it does seem like changing a lot of them and their slots has obviously benefited us but yeah, that's part one. See you shortly for part two. So we're on to the second show, the last week in November. And this time we're in Daytona Beach, Florida, where we've got just over 8,000 fans in attendance for Dynamite. We start off with basically the confrontation between Cody and Brandy Rhodes. 69 rated segment. Cody looked good and Brandy clearly enjoyed going off script. Basically, Cody just asks why... And then Brandy drops the hammer, the bombshell, confirming that she's seen another man and that her and Cody are done. She wants a divorce. Proper WWE booking, but it happened in the save, so we'll make it happen here. And that is the split of Cody and Brandy going public. Opening contest, back to the wrestling stuff, had good heat in decent wrestling. And Jacob Fatu and Brian Cage defeated the Motor City Machine Guns in 1221 when Jacob Fatu pinned Chris Saban with Machine Termination. A 70 rated match up here, again just continuing the dominance of the two big men. And unlucky this time for the Machine Guns. After the matchup, the two of them, alongside their manager Camille, basically state that they weren't involved in the tag team title picture. The Lucha Brothers may have the championship belts, but they want an opportunity. They beat the Bucks as well. Somebody make this tag match happen. So, 71. We'll keep an eye on what the tag division has planned for AEW. End of the line. Next up, it's a debut. An extremely short match. Claudio Castagnoli's first time running action is against the Dark Orders, John Silver. And he defeats them in 3 minutes of 48 with the Neutralizer. 55 rated matchup. A simple early victory for Castagnoli basically and one of my favourite guys on being the elite John Silver takes the L 
on this occasion. Claudio then cuts a promo just basically saying these are just warm-up matches. You've got a month to prepare Lance Archer. I'm going to take that TNT championship from you. And that was a 68-rated promo. An extremely short matchup with Joey Janela win and 401 with a moonsault foot stomp, a 47 rated matchup. Unfortunately, as I say, some people we have to take out the company and we have to job them out and we have to advertise that. So, yeah, that's what's basically going to be happening. So, it'll be constant squash matches before they're released from their contract. Next up, we have the six women tag match. And about that had decent reaction from the crowd, but subpar wrestling. The team of Hikaru Shida, Tenille Dashwood, and Nikki Storm. Defeated B. Priestley, Jamie Hater, and Penelope Ford in 920 when Hikaru Shida pinned Jamie Hater with the Tamahashi no free count. For the ladies, unfortunately, the crowd were not with, but we have to give them these opportunities to at least try and get their skills up and get their popularity up to cover for that. And yeah, as I say, Nikki Storm's just basically getting involved with the whole division to give them an opportunity on Dynamite. It's nowhere near where I want the women's division to be, but. Matches are going to help them develop so they can do that on a national television stage. Next up, a decent matchup saw Orange Cassidy defeat Stu Grayson in 9 12 with a super kick. So, after the beatdown from the Dark Order last week, freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy picks up the win in a 66 rated matchup. We then see Brody Lee alongside the reluctant Darby Allen, plus Stu Grayson and Eva Luno, hell throw Alex Reynolds and John Silver in the background and he's just basically berating them. He's pissed off that Stu Grayson lost to Orange Cassidy. He's pissed off that John Silver lost to Castagnoli. You know what happens here. Into his suit jacket, gets the papers and just starts lobbing it at Stu Grayson. Lobs some at Evil Uno, some at Alex Reynolds and some at um, John Silver but none Interestingly, at Darby Allen. So that's a 56 rated segment. We have another hype up for the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny, which is a 24. I mean, the guy has a glass eye. Why would you not be scared of that? And a decent matchup. The continual push of the Butcher and the Blade continues as they defeated Best Friends in 747 when the Butcher pinned Chuck Taylor with an interesting distraction from Priscilla Kelly. Of course, she is one of the female members of the Dark Order. So the Dark Order is kind of making a wee bit of an amends here. And a 55 rated matchup sees the Butcher and the Blade pick up the victory. Next up, we had singles action and it was a good wrestling match with a decent reaction from the crowd as we saw Isaiah Cassidy go one-on-one -on -one with Sammy Guevara and he defeated the Spanish God in 937 with a roll-up. 66 is pretty decent here. Guevara gets 70 but was off his game. Uh, yeah, just good to put these two in action. And it basically leads to the after segment, which if it actually decides to load, there we go, which sees the like of Cassidy, Quinn, Private Party being beaten down by the likes of Guevara, plus his other inner circle running mates, Jake Hager and Chris Jericho. Disappointingly, just a 56, but Jericho again showing the unity between the inner circle as they pick up a dominant beatdown on a private party. Next up, we've got a promo from Kenny Omega. He says, Hi man, I issued the challenge last week to no reply. Is there nothing this week either? You get one week to make a decision. When are we going to blow this feud off? So 85 there for that promo. Next up, John Moxley is hyping up his match with Wardlow. Of course, there's going to be Moxley versus MGF coming up at end of the line. And he just basically says, you're just a big guy, but you know, you're doing all MGF's work. And you know, you're funny to kick your ass then, cool, so be it. And I'm just going to have to go ahead and do that. So 87 for the Moxley promo. He came out of it looking excellent. And the main event matchup itself, actually very happy with that because I was unsure how Wardlow would do. But about they had great heat and good wrestling. Moxley defeats Wardlow in 14:28 with a Death Rider. 77. Look at the difference in performances. 91 plays a 44. So I think in that case we can be very happy with that main event. And to end the show, of course there's a beatdown from MGF. Moxley celebrating. MGF beats him down. 
and then stands above him with the AEW Heavyweight Championship. A solid 85 segment, MGF was underwhelming. Hopefully this is a program that can propel him to a higher level. And overall, the show gained a 75, which increased their popularity in 23 regions. I can confirm we're based on 90% of our top angle, which will help. But we're also based on three matches. So yeah, we need them to get like 70% of like the, the best match, etc. So the best match was a 77. Nothing else was even really, really remotely close. Maybe the Titans and the Guns. So I think overall I'll, I'll take that 75 and increase in 23 regions. A couple of signings have been made over the course of the last week. We will have Ishii on a short term contract and we've also signed, unless it spoils it here, a big strong boy from NXT UK who has made a few signings. Speaking of signings, MLW making four signings there. Eli Drake, Sammy Callahan, Flip Gordon and Heath have joined. Our show there was getting a lot of praise, that's good. We're actually not too far off getting to, to big actually. Just another four in each of the US. It's going to be expanding globally, that'll be a problem, especially with Europe, Oceania, India, etc. We're popular in the US, okay in Canada, good in the British Isles. Elsewhere, we'll take a bit of expanding, but that's cool. Um, MGF says Orange Cassidy doesn't connect with the fans. What? 2.72. ITV says Dynamite was not unhappy. Uh, sorry, was not up to their requirements, so they're unhappy with that. Now, what's interesting about that is if we just jump into uh, show history. Oh, we did 78 last week, right? Cool. So 76 seems to be the cutoff. We should just check it and double check. ITV, a 77. That's fine. So we're going to lose that deal because we aren't huge in um, the UK. So obviously. We will lose that one. We got another deal in the UK, but once we get a deal of these, I'm going to start looking to expand uh, and get deals elsewhere for the likes of, uh, well, basically anywhere bar the US and Canada, where we're basically got shows for Dynamite just now. So, but now Asia and Mexico has YouTube. We'll see what we can do. Um, I still think it's a bit too early for any AEW network. We aren't making massive amounts of profit. I say maybe about half a million. We are obviously going to have to spend money to make money, but I've also got a developmental as a kind of idea at one point along the line as well. So, yeah, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll now move on to December. Two more episodes, four more shows as we head to AW end of the line. So, thanks for watching. Stay safe. And I'll see you soon. Bye bye.